You know, Jesus talking about marriage just makes it look so simple. Uh, the world likes to make things complicated, don't they? Uh, when, when you know the Lord, uh, things are, are not as complicated as the devil would, would have you to think. Um, Mark chapter 10 Now, this is the same <clears throat> chapter where uh, you hear about the rich young ruler. In uh, verse 24 there, a, I better get the right chapter here. His disciples were, were astonished when, when Jesus told them that that rich young ruler was going to have a hard time getting to heaven. You know, we, we think people who are rich have it easy. But, you know, when it comes to eternity, uh, riches are not always the best thing. Sometimes people would rather have riches than, than Jesus. And uh, in, in the same uh, chapter, he, he asks the question a couple of times, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, let's see, I think it's in uh, uh, verses 36 and 51. He asks several different people, what would you that I should do for you? What a question. Yeah. What do, you, what do you want the Lord to do for you today? Uh, that's a good, good thing to consider. In, uh, in verse uh, 28, Peter said, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And, you know, that's, that's really the way we, we need to view things. When we leave this life, we're not going to take anything with us, are we? And uh, we need to have that attitude now. Probably the key verse to the whole book is verse 45. When it says, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, that's, that's the theme of the whole book of, of Mark, Christ the servant. And uh, what a blessing it is that Christ came uh, to be our Savior. He, he didn't come to be ministered to, he came to be a minister. He came to be our Savior. And this morning in Mark chapter 10 and starting in verse 1, I'm just going to read down through, through verse 12, and uh, this is a typical situation in Jesus' life where the Pharisees were confronting him about an issue and, and trying to make things difficult. Mark chapter 10, and starting in verse 1, and he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again, and as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command? They said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house his disciples asked him again of this same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. We'll just stop reading there. Uh, the Bible tells us that the, the Pharisees asked this question, not because they were so interested in the answer, but because they wanted to make it difficult. They were tempting him, it says there in, uh, in verse 2. Now, divorce was a common thing in those days, just probably like it is today. It, I don't know if you remember John the Baptist um, had said to Herod, uh, back in, in Mark chapter 6, that he, he was not to have his brother's wife. Herod had married his brother's wife. Her, we, we know her as Herodias because she's married to Herod. Well, if you know the story, uh, Herod wanted to kill John the Baptist, but he wasn't man enough to do it, so his wife did it for him. <laughs> uh, it's not a funny story, but uh, his, her daughter danced and pleases Herod. Uh, he was a very un, ungodly man, and uh, he says, I'll give you whatever you want. And at the mother's instigation, she says, give me the head of John the Baptist. And because he'd given his word and everybody saw him do it, 
John the Baptist was killed uh, because of that, because of his stand on marriage. That's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, now, notice the verse, I think, is Mark uh, 6, 16, uh, or th that's not the actual verse. Uh, um, it's verse 18. John had said unto Herod. See, John didn't put this in the paper. Uh, he didn't uh, go on a talk show. Uh, you know, he didn't uh, tell other people. John went to Herod and said, you shouldn't have your brother's wife. Uh, that's the way we deal with right and wrong. That's the way we deal with people face to face. And uh, John did that. Uh, that's, that's a sidelight, but it, it's important. And what you see here are two approaches. The Pharisees are basically asking, what will God allow? They use the word in verse 4, suffer. Moses suffered. Moses allowed to write a bill of divorcement. And you know, that's most people's approach to God. What can I get away with? <laughs> Jesus' attitude was, well, what did God command? What did, verse 3, what did Moses command you? And you know, that's the godly attitude. It's not, well, how much can I get away with? It's, what does God really want from me? And, you know, when we look at life, you know, we're looking particularly at marriage this morning, but when you look at life, it's not just what can I get away with. Listen, God will suffer many things. But someday we're going to be judged. Someday we're going to give an account of how we live and, and, and what we do. Uh, Jesus says, well, what did, what did God command? They're asking about divorce. Jesus is really saying, you know, they're saying, well, what about divorce? He's saying, well, what about marriage? <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things that are true just because, like he uses the phrase there, because of the hardness of our hearts. And don't you wish we lived in an ideal world? We don't. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that are true just because of the hardness of our hearts, because of the hardness of, uh, of parents and children and government and so on. But God has a, a standard that's beyond that, that we look to uh, for his, his holiness. They ask, what about divorce? Jesus Basically, it's saying, well, what about marriage? And I want to show you just a couple of things. It's a very simple message this morning. Uh, Jesus brings them back to God's pattern for marriage, God's purpose for marriage, and God's picture in marriage. Uh, those are really basic things. God's pattern for marriage, uh, understand this, marriage comes from God. Marriage is not a social institution. Uh, right from the beginning, God instituted. And whenever he talks about it, he always goes back to Genesis chapter 2. Adam and Eve, from the beginning, is what he talks about there in, in verse 6. From the beginning, uh, God sets the rules. He established marriage. And uh, one is, it's between one man and one woman. Verse 6, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, that doesn't seem like a real hard concept, but a lot of people seem to struggle with that. Uh, my wife is telling me that in some places now they have I've heard different numbers, 30, 60 different ways you're supposed to um, label people. It's, it's no more just man and woman. It's all these different things they've made up that, that makes no sense. Uh, God says it's between a man and a woman. That's God's pattern. And God set this right from the beginning. And let me say, the beginning wasn't millions of years ago. It wasn't even 60,000 years ago. It was at creation. You read the Bible, it's about six, 7,000 years ago. Let me tell you, 1,000 years is a long time. <laughs> you might think this sermon is a long time. <laughs> you know, you're waiting for your computer to boot up. You think, man, a half a minute, that's a long time. Well, 1,000 years is a long time. And uh, to talk about 40,000, 60,000, 60 million is it, just ridiculous. The Bible gives us a record. Uh, it, number one about marriage, it's between one man and one woman. Secondly, it establishes a new home. Verse 7, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Uh, when a man and a woman get married, that's a family. Now, they may add to that family. Some people add one. Some people add a lot. <laughs> Twelve, twenty, who knows? Uh, but it's a family, and, and it's, a, it's a unit. There's, there's been a, a teaching that it takes a village to raise a child. God doesn't say that. God has established the home. He's established the church. 
He's also established government, but he doesn't give government the responsibility to raise our children. That's right. Uh, it, it's, it's our home is number one. And as a home, you need to be a part of, uh, of a church. Uh, let me tell you, I don't want to get too far off on this, but uh, things run by a village or by a tribe. There's no freedom there. There's no religious freedom. There's no social freedom. You have to toe the line. You have to fit in or, or you're out. Don't, don't be mis, misled by that kind of um, fairy tale view of, uh, of primitive life. Um, it, it takes a family, and when, when a person gets, when people get married, that's a family. Number three, verse eight, it makes them one. They twain shall be one flesh. Now, in case you don't understand Old English, twain means two. They're saying that uh, you know, if we keep changing marriage, the next thing will be multiple partners will be, will be recognized. Um, the Bible says it's two people become one. So then they are no more two, but, but one flesh. Um, thirdly, it's permanent. Verse 9, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now that's, that's God's standard. Uh, that's God's, God's pattern. And the, the reason he's saying this is because they asked about divorce. Now, divorce is a common part of life, isn't it? Um, if you've been divorced, there's no animosity in, in, in this this morning. In fact, there's, there's hope because uh, divorce is like any other sin. Uh, it can be forgiven. And uh, the Bible says the way to deal with it is just to confess it and, uh, and trust the Lord. But we don't want to excuse it. We don't want to promote it. And we don't want to explain it away. And when it comes to divorce, uh, they ask Jesus, uh, what about divorce? And he says, well, what did, what did Moses say? And then he explains about marriage. And that's, that's the important thing. The, the basis of marriage is found in Genesis chapter 2. And uh, the idea, you know, in a wedding, quite often they'll say, till death do us part. That comes from the Bible as well. Romans chapter 7 and 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Jesus was just quoting uh, Moses and uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. Well, where does divorce fit in? Well, he said here, it fits in with the hardness of our heart. Uh, divorce takes place because at least one of those two has hardened their heart against what God wants. Um, that's hard, isn't it? You know, we can do it. God, God says it, it, it's there. But somebody has to harden their heart first. I, I know that sometimes there's people who are divorced who don't want to be because the, their partner said, I'm, I'm divorcing you. Uh, usually it's mutual. But uh, when we leave God's pattern is when divorce comes in. And the Bible says in Malachi chapter 2, God hates divorce. You know, God made, he wants us to have that ideal thing. Uh, two becoming one, having a family, uh, you know, uh, raising godly children. Malachi 2.16, he says, The Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Putting away is just the Old Testament way of, of saying divorce. And he says, Therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. If you've been around divorce at all, you know uh, there oftentimes can be treachery involved. In... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, Jesus talks about, or, or the Lord talks about some of the things that, that come up. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, he says, Under the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. He says, that's, that's what the Bible says we should do. We shouldn't divorce. We shouldn't leave. But if we do, he says, uh, well, don't, uh, don't remarry. We deal with it, like I said, as we would any other, other sin. And you know, that our sin is under the blood. Aren't you glad of that? There, there's some sins that have more consequences socially and, and physically. But sin is sin. Yeah, you know, my pride is... is just as much sin as, uh, as stealing or swearing or uh, you know, hurting someone. And, and the Bible says in, in 1 John, 
If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. That's a little word, but boy, it covers everything, doesn't it? Aren't you glad? Uh, God's, God's pattern is clear. And yet, in a lot of things in life, we, we don't fit to God's pattern. And yet, God helps us, and God works with us, and, and God forgives us our sin. God's pattern brings us then to God's purpose in marriage. And, and you know, it's almost embarrassing how, how simple this is. Uh, God's purpose in marriage, number one, is that people have children. <laughs> you know, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, he said that we were to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And God's pattern for us to have children is in marriage. It's not outside of marriage. It's not spreading seed here, there, and everywhere. Uh, this is very basic. It's very practical. It's very obvious. <laughs> uh, this is one of the basic uh, purposes uh, of marriage. But not just children. Uh, I read Malachi 2.16. Malachi 2.15 says... Did not he make one? He's talking about marriage. Wherefore one? That ye might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously. God wants us to have godly children. Not just children. It's not a competition who can have the most children. <laughs> uh, God wants us to have a family. And God wants us to, if we have children, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He tells us to be fruitful and multiply. But as well, marriage is there for companionship. Uh, you know the verse in Genesis 2.18. He said, it's not good uh, for the man to be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Marriage is there for, for companionship. Uh, God's goal for marriage is oneness. And the problem we have, uh, I believe, is that we approach marriage oftentimes from the, from the wrong end. Uh, we're soul, spirit, and body. We're made in the image of God. We're a three-part being. Usually we approach marriage from the body side first. And, and nowadays, most people don't even bother with marriage. They just get together physically and hope for the best. And if this one doesn't work out, maybe the next one will. But we need to take the approach of, first of all, being united in spirit. Uh, 2 Corinthians, let me make sure I get this correct, 6 verse 14 uh, he says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yeah, that's God's command. First, there needs to be a spiritual connection. There needs to be two Christians. Then there needs, needs to be uh, our spirit. When we talk about our spirit, we're usually talking about our mind, will, and emotions. Uh, you need to come together in, in those. You need to, uh, to blend, blend your, uh, your spirit. And, and then in marriage, we come together physically. But uh, we, we turn that around and wonder why we're so messed up. In many homes today, uh, sure, they have a physical attraction. And then they'll use an expression like, oh, we, we fell out of love. We don't love each other anymore. You know the problem? They, didn't, they never loved each other to start with. See, a physical attraction, that's lust. Lust has a good part in marriage. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with lust in marriage, you know, in, in the way that God intends it. But that's not the, the motivation we need for life and for, for marriage. We, we turn it around, we turn it upside down, wonder why it doesn't work. Uh, one pastor was asked the question, how old does my daughter need to be before she's old enough to date? And uh, the daughter was over here, the dad was over here, and he, could, he knew he had to give a good answer. And uh, he gave three things. I, I, I just repeat these, these to you. Uh, this has to do with what we're talking about this morning. He said, well, number one, they need to be aware of both the benefits and dangers of dating. Now, some of you may not believe in dating. That's all right. Um, they need to be aware of both the benefits and dangers of, of dating, of looking for a, a bride or a groom. Secondly, when you've, you're old enough when you've personally worked out from scriptures a set of dating standards. As a Christian, we need to have standards. You know, one would be, I won't date someone that's not a Christian. I won't get involved physically, and so on. And then thirdly, when you purpose, you'll never lower that standard, even if it means losing dates. <laughs> I thought those were three pretty good points. There's probably more, more involved than that. But you know, most people, 
uh, approach marriage from the physical rather than from the spiritual first. Right. And uh, that needs to be number one. Uh, there needs to be a, a union uh, spiritually. You need to have the same Savior. God gave marriage, the purpose of marriage, one was to continue mankind. If, if people quit having children now, uh, we wouldn't be here much longer. <laughs> I don't know, maybe another hundred years. Secondly, for companionship. And then a, an interesting one in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says as well, to avoid fornication. Now, the world doesn't see that as much of a motive, but God wants us to have godly seed. He wants us to enjoy companionship. 1 Corinthians 7, he says, Now, concerning the things whereof I wrote unto you, uh, I'm sorry, whereunto ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, he's saying it's okay not to be married there. <laughs> Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Isn't it wonderful how the Bible talks about sexual things? It's so nice. <laughs> Nowadays, people are so crude and rude as to how they talk. Uh, I love seeing how God puts it gently and, and specifically. He's talking about physical things here in verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. Likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Uh, God says another reason for marriage is to, to avoid fornication. And he says the main limit in marriage there in chapter 7, verse 39, is only in the Lord. Uh, marriage for Christians is only in the Lord. Uh, in Hebrews 13 and verse 4, God says that marriage and, and sexual things are good in marriage. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Now, that's a good part of marriage. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You see, God sets the standard. God sets the rules. Uh, he says what's sin and what's not sin. And uh, we need to follow God's pattern. We need to live for God's purpose. God has a, a pattern and a purpose in marriage. It's for our benefit. It's for our good. But to me, the greatest part of, of marriage is God has a picture in marriage. Look, look with me, if you would, in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll read just a few verses from verse 21. Like I said, this is, is nothing new this morning, but uh, I just wanted to remind you of the simplicity in, in Christ that we have. Ephesians 5, verse 21, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He goes on, he talks about the mystery of marriage and of the church, but he, and he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The, the reality, you know, whenever you have a picture, you have a reality. Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. That's right. The reality is Christ and the church. And uh, we need to understand... Uh, Marriage is, is so precious because it pictures God's love for us, Christ's love uh, for us. Yeah, you, you probably know John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what marriage pictures. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the picture he's talking about in verse 25 of Ephesians 5. <clears throat> Husbands are to love their wives, and he says, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's total commitment. Uh, that's a sacrificial love. Uh, this is not just a physical relationship. Uh, this is oneness, uh, like he talks about uh, for marriage. That's the pattern of marriage because it's picturing something very specific, Christ and the, and the church. Now, the difference is, He's the Savior. <laughs> I'm to picture what Christ is like, but I'm not the Savior. Uh, I'm going to have my flaws and, and so on. And God has a pattern and a purpose in marriage. 
And as a husband, I'm to, I'm to love my wife. Uh, as a wife, they're, they're to submit themselves uh, to their husband. And, you know, that's to picture what Christ has done. But, you know, God also has a purpose and a pattern in knowing him. Knowing God is not just any old way we, we choose. Uh, there's only one way to God. It's God's way. The Bible says it's through Jesus. Jesus said you must be born again. You know, a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, they understand physical birth, and that's what Jesus related it to. We understand physical birth. He says, like that, he said, it's like that, you need to be born again. You need to be born spiritually, born into the family of God, made alive spiritually. You know, you can't become a Christian without trusting Christ. It just doesn't work. That's not Christianity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's John 14, 6. He's the way. Uh, Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. <laughs> wow, that, that really limits it, doesn't it? Very, uh, very narrow way. Yeah, it's exactly what the Bible calls it. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Jesus is the only way of salvation. And let me say this as well. You can't trust Christ without believing the Bible. That's how we know who he is. You know, when he talks about the gospel in, 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 in Corinthians, he says that it's Christ. Let me just get to it here. 15, there it is. He says he delivered the gospel to us, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. See, it's not just that he died, it's that he died according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, Peter put it this way in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. This is, I think this is a, a really important verse to at least know where it is. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, he says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know the problem? Most people are trying to get born again or spiritual by corruptible seed. It's only by the word of God that we can be born again. It, you know, it's not by a church. It, it's not by a, a work, baptism. It's not by who my parents are or where I live. Uh, you know, I've known people who thought everybody in America was Christian because it's a Christian country. <laughs> they used to call it that. I don't know if they still do. Uh, the Bible says we're born again by the Word of God. It says the Word of the Lord endureth forever. That's the difference between, between corruptible and incorruptible. All these other things, they won't last the test of eternity. The Bible will. It's through Christ. You can't become a Christian without trusting Christ, and you can't trust Christ without trusting God's Word. You know, when we come to issues like marriage and other things, Listen, they're not nearly as important as whether a person is born, born again or not. But they're important because they come from God's Word. They're God's pattern. Uh, for us as Christians, we, you know, we can read Mark chapter 10 and see, oh, that's simple. <laughs> but, you know, there's people who, who defile the Word of God. There's people who resent the Word of God. There's people who distort it and uh, all kinds of things that, that they do with God's Word. If we'll just simply believe it, you know, really, I, you know, I've, I told you, I've printed out some things for you to hand out if, if you want. I was thinking it would probably be just as well to print off the first nine verses of Mark chapter 10. Hand those out. You know, very simple, isn't it? Uh, we don't need to have hardened hearts. We need to, to follow what God has done from the beginning. And you know, it's the same with salvation. It's always been by faith. Salvation has always been by faith. And this morning, uh, let me encourage you, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior according to the Scriptures, do it today. God says today is the day of salvation. If you have trusted Christ, listen, grow in faith. Fight for the faith. Live by faith. Uh, follow the Lord. Value God's Word. Uh, there's people in, in the world who'd love to be able to have a Bible and, and follow it, uh, who, who can't because of uh, persecution. Uh, we have it so easy that, man, most of us have three, four, five, ten Bibles and don't read any of them. Uh, we, need to, we need to follow God's Word. It's by faith. 
Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Uh, this morning, uh, I, I don't know where you stand on all these issues, but I, I think it's very important where you stand on trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you know Christ? If you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Uh, that's the, the question for eternity. Uh, you know, we can, we can be salt and light, but only Jesus can be the Savior. And uh, that's the one that we live for, and that's the one we present to others. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer this morning. With your heads bowed and <clears throat> in an attitude of prayer, maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to follow the Lord in, in believer's baptism or uh, whatever your need might be. Listen, he, he knows you. He loves you. He has a perfect way for you. Father, thank you so much for your, your word. Lord, help us to, uh, to believe and obey you. Father, I pray if there are those, if there's anyone here that's not saved, Lord, that they would be convicted of their sin and drawn to you, that they would trust you today. Lord, help us to take heart in that you're coming again and that we can live for you. And uh, Lord, that you can use us to be what we need to be in, in our community and in our church, in our families. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing page 163.